right. Hello, all you lovely people out there trying to make the world a better place. Welcome to the Dead Man Walking Podcast. I am your host, Repeatedly Dead Fred, and I am the author of the soon-to-be-released medical trauma memoir, The Summer I Died 20 Times, which is what actually happened to me. Thus, I am Repeatedly Dead Fred. Today, I am thrilled to have with me Debbie Noir, who is a woman of many talents, um, both in the traditional job world and with a couple of side gigs. And I think we're going to start off with uh, Debbie showing us one of her side gigs. Debbie, take it away. Hello, hello. Okay, hold on a second. Kids, don't try this at home. Oops. <laughs> That's okay. All right. That's about Here. as much as I can do in this very small space. I was afraid I was going to hit something. <laughs> yeah. So those are called juggling sticks. And Some people are... call them devil sticks. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And what's the connection there? I actually don't know, but they were invented in China um, like hundreds of years ago and have been used in many cultures across the world. I mean, we see them in um, like Hawaiian juggling. They And sometimes you see them juggling with fire and mm -hmm. they became really popular about 30 years ago. Oh, cool. And everybody started doing them and yeah. And I caught on. It was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> so you both, you make them as one of your side gigs. Yeah. Yeah. And you perform with them. I do. Yeah. I mean, okay. I play, perform, play. They're made out of um, wooden doweling. This particular mm -hmm. pair is a heavy set, but they're all made with, this is recycled inner tube tires from bicycles. So I go to bicycle stores and I ask them to give me their garbage. And mm -hmm. then I cut them up and, and cut them and take them apart. And, and, and then I create little um, tassels in the top because in order for this to spin, it has to have weighted ends. Mm -hmm. And so this one is made completely of recycled tire and these are, these are glow in the dark. So when it gets really dark, I don't know if you can see, they actually kind of, mm -hmm. kind of glow. And so those are fun. And then the hand sticks are made the exact same way. And I make them all by hand and they come in lots of different colors and designs. They could be custom made if you like your own colors mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. And they're How for long sale. Does it take to uh, make a set like that. Well, it's a hard question because I don't make them one one at a time. I make like all the pieces and then I assemble mm -hmm. all the pieces afterwards. So mm -hmm. I'll make like a set of six. It could take me a couple of days to make six, but mm -hmm. like not like not 48 hours worth. But mm -hmm. yeah. You are very creative. Mm -hmm. So Debbie and I met um, through a leadership course, maybe 2018, was it? Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. like that just before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah, way before the pandemic way before the pandemic i think so and uh deanna petrini the lady who ran that course gave me my nickname repeatedly dead fred <laughs> and, uh, so um debbie has an interesting story you're traditionally a nurse is that correct correct i'm a registered nurse for 27 years mm -hmm. and then you did a little bit of a pivot you went into a a very specialized area of nursing. So mm -hmm, you share mm -hmm. a little bit about how that happened. Sure. Well, um, well, it's a long story, but basically after I had my children, my first child, and I went back to work as a registered nurse in the hospital, I had a, um, I don't know how to call it. I just vibed with helping mothers with their babies to breastfeed. I had had a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I went back to work after I had my first child, I had the, the, like the, the, the honor of working with one of the most famous lactation consultants in the world. And mm -hmm. his name is Dr. Jack Newman. 
and he's probably retired now, but anybody mm-hmm. who's ever worked with breastfeeding support in the past 30, 40 years has worked with or has heard of Dr. Jack Newman. He's written many books. He's been an advocate of breastfeeding for mothers. Um, and he comes from Toronto. So he had a clinic and I got to work with him, which was amazing before I ever became a lactation consultant. And I just, it worked. It just vibed. I was really good at it. And I really mm-hmm. loved helping these mummies and babies to connect. And I became a lactation consultant. And that's what I've been doing for the past 20 years, is helping mummies and babies after their babies are born, helping them to feed. So I had never heard of a lactation consultant. And I guess unless, you know, you're a parent mm. who uh, has a child with difficulty latching or whatever the, you know, there's a number of difficulties with breastfeeding. Um, you probably wouldn't know, but I imagine it's more common than we think. So breastfeeding, you would think is like, it's like no questions asked. It's a simple thing. Mm -hmm. Women have breasts, we have babies, our bodies work, and it, it would be something in many places that I would not have a job right? Because Mm -hmm. there's many cultures on the planet where we help each other and women help each other, particularly with breastfeeding and support like that in smaller rural communities. We'll find midwives and um, other members of the community, family members, sisters, aunties, mothers, whatever, who will be able to help that mother and that young family with feeding their babies. We in North America traditionally don't have that kind of support, right? Mm. So we traditionally have a lot of mothers who have um, um, cesarean sections, any kind of um, medical intervention that would prevent breastfeeding from maybe getting off to a great start. And over the 30, 40, 50 years, the lactation consultants have really begun to make a presence in the medical community. We find that um, breastfeeding rates drop significantly within the first week or two after baby's born, if if they start at all. So are you saying that if somebody doesn't have a natural birth canal, uh, I guess, birth, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it has an effect on the hormonal system and the lactation process might not get kicked into full gear. So, yeah, we know I had two cesarean sections myself and it's true Mm -hmm. that the interventions do affect the way babies feed. Um, Usually the, the, the trauma of surgery on a mother's body is enough to prevent the second stage of what we call, um, galactogenesis so the first stage of making milk galactogenesis is Mm -hmm. happens when we get pregnant and our breasts start to grow and the structures inside the breasts that make milk begin to grow and proliferate and so when our babies are born and there's an exchange of hormones happening um as the as the um the uterus is expelled and there's a a quick shift in hormones and usually in a natural birth a baby a mother would start to feel a change in her milk supply by about day two day three after baby's Mm -hmm. born that means that the milk that's coming in the first two to three days is very thick and sticky it's very important milk it's very early milk it's called colostrum and that is the the magical substance that lines the baby's completely um bare digestive tract and helps Mm. to pull all of the goodness through helps the baby to poop out all the all the garbage that's left over in the in the intestines so by day two day three the second stage of galactogenesis normally kicks in where mother's they say they all of a sudden feel very full and the milk kind of there's a lot of milk in -hmm. the case of the cesarean section or other interventions that can happen this doesn't happen on day two day three it usually happens by day five sometimes a bit longer Mm -hmm. and that's also the combination of mother having difficulty to position herself she's just had a major abdominal surgery actually Mm -hmm. and if i remember correctly the colostrum uh also plays a role in that it's the template for the immune system. And it a hundred percent is, that, <clears throat> uh, which could explain why so many people are immunocompromised and have all these um, allergies and things that they didn't have fifty years ago. Exactly right. Like again, I mentioned that we call colostrum liquid gold for a good reason. It is the color mm-hmm. of gold, 
It's very thick. It's packed with antibodies and immune protections and all the vitamins. In fact, everything our babies need. In fact, if we think about it, Fred, the human species wouldn't be around if breastfeeding didn't work and human breast mm -hmm. milk wasn't important for our babies, right? Mm -hmm. So the value of having that colostrum as the first food that mother that, that mother is able to give to baby or baby receives, even if it's in micro drops, is enough to coat the entire baby's digestive tract and mm -hmm. help protect the baby from all of the examples that you gave. Yeah, and I was more. just listening to a podcast on the microbiome yesterday <laughs> and it was talking about the mucus layers in the um, digestive tract mm -hmm. and how they're like this magical barrier. Um, and if it doesn't develop properly, we're extra susceptible to things like the SARS COVID and things like that. So I um, spent my past three years, I mean, I recently just resigned from my position, but my past three years was spent in a dream job. I had hoped it would be a dream job, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because of COVID and working in the hospital ended up not being a dream job for those reasons. But what we did down at, at what at down in Mount Sinai that many people don't know about is that there mm -hmm. is what's called a milk bank. And mm -hmm. that's where I worked for the past three years. And what happens at the milk bank is that mothers um, whose babies are very premature, any baby under 32 weeks actually is prescribed um, pasteurized human breast milk for their babies, especially in the early days if mommy doesn't have enough or if there's been mm -hmm. a separation of baby or for whatever reason, mother's milk hasn't come in. So imagine the 30, the 28 week or the 24 week old baby who's been birthed prematurely and they have a lot of medical challenges. Mm -hmm. we need to get mother's own breast milk into that baby by whatever means, even if it's by nasogastric tube into the baby's body as quickly as possible. But sometimes with these traumatic situations, these mothers don't have time to make the milk right away. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, um, the, the Rogers Hickson human milk bank um, was founded about 10 years ago um, by a woman called Debbie Stone. And they, the purpose of the milk bank is to provide every neonatal, neo, neonatal intensive care unit across Ontario with mm -hmm. access to human breast milk that has been pasteurized and been donated from mothers across the province. So the milk is collected, is picked up as from a, as a donation for mothers who are um, screened and are eligible to become donors. The milk is then processed and then redistributed back across the province of Ontario for all the babies under 32 weeks. That's amazing. So is this sort of like a blood service Canada? People just come to a, a unit and they can, you know, lactating well, mothers can make a it's donation? Funny. Yeah, in Quebec, that's what they do. The Quebec, um, the Quebec milk bank functions similarly to that. In the case of um, a milk banking, it has to be a frozen product. So the bank okay. will only receive a frozen product. So we don't actually have anybody coming into the milk bank. It's all done by donation in their own homes, according to the guidelines that the milk bank sets out for cleansing, cleaning the equipment and just mm -hmm. understanding how to pump for the the particular needs of the very premature babies in Ontario. So how do you have a rough idea of how many people would have to access the bank? So we know that all baby that, that there is a constant supply of milk coming in and going out. Mm -hmm. So we are more than meeting the needs of our premature babies under 32 weeks. That's amazing. Yeah, there's, you know, yeah, it is amazing. So I imagine at some point mothers are just like, I've had enough of this, you know, uh, I'm tired of pumping, but other people. It's a it. lot of work. It's a lot of work. And it's a lot to ask a new mother to do that. The sad cases are, Fred, is that you can imagine in those cases where a mother has extra milk and she's happy to pump a little bit extra for a baby who needs it. There mm -hmm. are cases, sadly, where um, babies have passed mm -hmm. and the mother is still still enters lactogenesis too, right? So she's stuck. She's already, her baby's passed, unfortunately, and she's still making milk. And those mothers often want to donate as a give back. 
Or maybe the baby spent some time in intensive care and passed and they've got leftover milk that they'd like to donate. So it's unfortunately, some cases are quite sad. Yeah, well, I think those women automatically get a sainthood designation. So that's pretty special. But I so. want to end with something really cool that we did at the Milk Bank, mm -hmm. which was actually um, a research project that was studied all around the world during COVID. But we mm -hmm. did it at the Milk Bank and we took a glass of breast milk and we spiked it with COVID. And we tested the milk after the COVID was in there and had, the milk had been spiked and mm -hmm. the COVID was neutralized completely. Because it was so high in mucus that it just swallowed it up? It's just so high in, in antiviral properties. And we mm -hmm. don't even know the depth of the magic of breast milk. Mm -hmm. But we do know, it wasn't a big surprise to lactation consultants that it did that actually. Mm -hmm. we, we know it does that. We know mm -hmm. that when babies drink mother's breast milk for the first at least two to three months, the chances of a baby getting sick is next to mm -hmm. none. Because when mother is sick, if the mother gets sick, she passes her immunity through her breast milk by passive immunity to her baby. Amazing. It's, mm -hmm. it's like we were designed, you know, with all these subsystems to keep us healthy. So yeah, it's a so magical, you... it's a magical substance. And um, we have an abundance of it. So my, uh, my goal is for more babies to drink more human milk and figuring mm -hmm. out why that's not happening enough. Mm -hmm. So you took a little pivot, you mentioned, and you left the hospital and you started up some, your own gig called Materially mm -hmm. Yours. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to share a little bit about that? Sure. Well, that actually started probably about 10 years ago when I was still working full time as a nurse in other areas in Toronto. I started my own private gig and I would go and see mothers, um, you know, and by referral only. It wasn't a real business. Mm -hmm. And then a friend of mine developed me a, some lovely business cards and the name and we kind of moved mm -hmm. on from there. So I've been doing it part time for a long time. I was um, my previous position for 13 years. Um, actually worked in, with a nursing agency. And my job was to visit mothers in their home, high-risk mothers, mothers mm -hmm. after cesarean sections, or maybe um, multiple births, or just mothers who are struggling on many levels, and go into their homes and help them. So for seven years, I traveled the the breadth of cultural diversity in our mm -hmm. GTA, and the depth of socioeconomic status. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot, a ton. It was the most amazing experience. And so now going into people's homes, I have a, an extra sensitivity and an, an extra level of understanding. So when um, I left the hospital, I was getting a lot of business and um, COVID has really taken a hit mm -hmm. on our new mothers and babies. Mm -hmm. In addition to all the other areas, Fred, I'm sure you know being... I'm familiar with the hospital system Unfortunately, intimately, yes. right? We mm -hmm. have a lack of, 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 we have a lack of resources right now. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I decided to leave was because the clients who are coming to me these days are saying there is no breastfeeding support. They're coming mm -hmm. home from the hospitals with no breastfeeding support um, and a bottle of formula, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to get help. If that wasn't bad enough, we can compound it with the fact that in the past 12 months, we had a formula shortage, which still exists in part of Ontario. Mm -hmm. And now you've told me the value. You've told me the value of human breast milk. Right? Yeah. So why are we having mothers coming home from the hospital with formula? I don't know, and but I ran into my friend's wife uh, like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And they've got a six month old and, mm -hmm. you know, they're not on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. And she said, I can't find breast milk anywhere. This is in Thornhill. Like she can't find formula. Uh, you mean, formula. Not breast Sorry. Milk. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, right. Definitely and, a problem. And and we, and we know there's an excess of breast milk because we know what's happening at the milk bank. And that's mm -hmm. only a small piece. Mm hmm of all of the mothers who have access to milk, who, the opportunities are there. So mm -hmm. my goal with maternally yours is to look ahead a couple of generations from now mm -hmm. and see how 
the effects of more babies drinking more human breast milk, how that will affect our society, right? How mm -hmm. it will affect the health of our society, how it will affect the mental health of our society. Because when we breastfeed, we have mummy and baby skin to skin. Mm -hmm. And that piece of attachment that happens in the first two weeks of life, we know from abundant research that the attachment creates a healthy child who will become a healthy adult who can develop relationships as well, right? So in addition mm -hmm. to the, the benefits of breast milk itself, one of my biggest focuses is on keeping mothers and babies super close together, yeah. right? That's and like, that's, that's my goal, right? So. And that skin important. to skin also affects the immune system because there's that transfer of mm -hmm. um, bacterias and microbes and things like that. Exactly. Um, the you're good system. you could be a lactation consultant fred yeah maybe not <laughs> <laughs> so i have one one last lactation question and uh, and then i want to pivot because i noticed you got some pretty funky bling on your hands <laughs> i do i do i have some fun stuff so uh, are there any cultural stigmas that um will prevent some women from accepting outside donations of breast milk like they have you run across anything like that or is it pretty universally accepted um there we there were calls I, I i'm not sure i understand your question but i'll try and answer it based on what i think you're asking me there were for example there were some very religious jewish families who mm -hmm. wanted to make sure where their milk was coming from where the where the milk that they would be receiving it coming from because they wanted to make sure that the person who was donating it was kosher as if as if that mattered right i, I don't know how that would yeah. matter or not and then we can't provide that information to donors um mm -hmm. uh, to recipients of breast milk for one thing and the other part is is that it's mixed so we usually take about five donors and mix all their milk together that milk is oh. then pasteurized as a unit because when you pasteurize different mother's milk you're getting a variety in that mm -hmm. milk there's there's it, it, it increases variability of catching more opportunities for more goodness and taking away the badness too through the pasteurization that's interesting so um i'm going to ask my rabbi if that's a real concern or if that's just people going over the edge that's a good so. question well i mean again and then the other piece to that you know mothers who are pumping religious mothers who are pumping on the weekends they don't use electric pumps right or battery mm -hmm. operated pumps they have to use a manual pump so there mm -hmm. are cultural things that you know you know there are some cultures um there are some cultures, for example, the, the foods that they eat, like the, the, the amazing foods that they'll eat has mm -hmm. a deep, has a, has a huge effect on the parents and the, the mother and the health of the mother. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, culture and real and breastfeeding, it's like life, the, 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 the points of life that are celebrated, um, mm -hmm. you really get to see that in the birth of a baby and in their home and the way mm -hmm. the whole family kind of sometimes comes together and supports a mom. Very cool. I did. I did want to mention one other thing, though, mm -hmm. quickly, if I may, if that's OK, mm -hmm. if we have a bit of time. I just want to say that one of the one of the things I am working on right now is working with um, a couple of um, women shelters, young women shelters downtown. Um, mm -hmm. And they are um, these, you know, equity deserving communities are looking for support and can't afford that support. So part of my goal with maternally yours is to do all of the above and to access those communities that need help by mm -hmm. helping to teach them to help themselves through, with my education and with my experience to support them to start helping themselves within the community so that they don't have the stress of having to look for a lactation consultant. There may be someone in their immediate circle in the mm -hmm. community who can, who can support them with breastfeeding. So that's a, a project that's in progress. Well, you might be nominated for St. Hood soon doing all this good stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So let's talk about your other side gig. Mm -hmm. which is the sticks in your bling and your beads yeah it's just art right like this is mm -hmm. my therapy just art yeah. yeah it's my therapy like when I'm like it's just what I do I can't keep my hands still mm -hmm. like I can't watch a movie 
oh. without doing something. Like I can't, okay. like I, 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 it's very hard for me to turn off from that. And it's mm-hmm. been my whole life. It's just the way I, I, I um, express myself. So I use, um, now I'm using tiny, tiny, weeny little beads and making mm-hmm. all kinds of things, pretty mm-hmm. things that will be for sale at my show um, at the end of this month. A show. I'm having a little trunk show in my home to, um, mm-hmm. yeah, for holiday, prior, just before the holiday season. Do you have perhaps any samples that you could show the audience? I do. Let's see. I just made these ones the other day mm-hmm. and I love them. They're extra long. These are pretty pair of earrings. Mm-hmm. So, I can see. Oh, very cool. They're almost Actually, taller than you are. They are. <laughs> so I made a few in the series with this color combination. You can see they're very tiny, tiny, tiny little beads. Mm-hmm. And they're strung together. And um, and you can make all kinds of cool stuff with them. It's lots of fun. I have, um, I have some other little ones here. Pretty little, little things. There we go. There we go. A pretty little earring like that. Oh, I have some other style. Yeah, I have um, rings. I have some pretty beaded rings. Um, for mm-hmm. example, this one. This is the way. This is how I combined beading and breastfeeding. If there was a possible way to combine <laughs> combine beading and breastfeeding, I did it mm-hmm. with this ring here. <laughs> that is hilarious. Okay, I get it. I don't know if the. Uh... The audience will, but here we go. They're breasts very cute. right there. Yeah. Yeah. And on this oh. hand, I have the happy face. So these I, are both. I think those breasts might have just gotten us banned from YouTube. <laughs> no way. Come on now. We can always talk about that. I I'll, I can argue that this pre- this cute little ring here is part of a collection that I'm making for people. Um, Actually, the proceeds of all of these rings, these happy face rings, and they come in sad faces as well. Um, Mm -hmm. are going towards supporting the mental health of these young mothers downtown. So any purchases of these will go directly towards the program that is in place to help these mothers. And so I actually go downtown. um, I'm going downtown next week um, to teach four classes to Mm -hmm. these moms and teaching them to bead. So this is a volunteer um, project that I do with them as well. And it allows me to connect with them. And we have conversations about all kinds of things and we be mm-hmm. together. So we teach it. I teach them different projects and hopefully for some that might become a passion project for them. Like it is for me mm-hmm. and um, we'll see where it goes, but yeah, it's and exciting. So what else do you make? You make necklaces and wristbands. I have necklaces. And... I have bracelets. I have earrings mm-hmm. and I have juggling sticks. Oh, so um, the question I often ask towards the end of the interview, mm-hmm. if somebody wants to get in touch with you to maybe <clears throat> have you give a class or talk mm-hmm. about the, you know, the services you offer or mm-hmm. perhaps attend your trunk show or find mm-hmm. some of your gifts, how do they get Absolutely. a hold of you? So I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I have a website. Um, So on Instagram and Facebook for um, the different two different businesses for the breastfeeding, it's maternallyyours.ca. And that's with two L's and two Y's. So maternally has two L's and yours together, maternallyyours.ca. And on Facebook and Instagram, I am maternallyyoursgta. Mm Mm-hmm. On Instagram and Facebook for my other business, I am DCN Designs. And that stands for Dream, Create, and Nurture. Also the initials of my name, but that's extra. DCN underscore designs. And that's where you can find me. And in terms of the show, that is all listed on my Facebook page. I think there's a public, there's a, an open page event that I've created for this show. I can put it up or link it to you afterwards, Fred, and you mm-hmm. can pass it on if you'd like, the, both of the the mm-hmm. uh, the links. And I'm super mm-hmm. grateful for that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Do you also give the uh, juggling sticks lessons? Or I mean, I can. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. I sell them. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I'm always up to juggle. I, I went to Kensington market this summer for one of the pedestrian Sundays and they had the drumming circles going on. I have a great, mm -hmm. it was someone took a video of me juggling with the drumming in the background and the juggling sticks. It was just mm -hmm. divine. Cool. So yeah, Sounds I can like teach any time. I can teach any time, but a lot of it's just picking it up, pick them up and give them a try. And, and you'll do a lot of dropping before they eventually stay up in the air. <laughs> well, I'm sure the majority of what I would do would be dropping. So, okay. So do you want to play the game before uh, we end? I want to play the game. Okay. So pick a number between one and 36. And if you don't like the question, you can pass and we can try another one. Okay. 33. <laughs> Um, if you could have any animal as a pet, what would you choose? Oh, a dog. Well, I love too dogs. Easy. I love dogs. Well, it's not so easy, Fred, because I'm mm -hmm. not allowed to have any pets in my place. Oh, so it's not okay. that easy. I love pets. I would have mm -hmm. a cat. I would have a dog. I would even have a little miniature pig. I would have any animal. <laughs> My daughter wants yeah. a pig. I would have any animal. I love animals. I absolutely mm -hmm. adore them. So unfortunately, I can't have any. My landlord won't let us have any. And mm -hmm. um, so I would love a dog in my well, in another time, perhaps. Well, my landlord would love to have a dog as well, uh, but I'm very allergic to okay. stuff. So that puts the kibosh on it. And, uh, That's what he's saying is the reason that he doesn't want any pets in the house, but he doesn't live here. So I don't know what's the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people are just haters. I think that's what it is, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. So what kind of dog would you prefer? Like a medium sized dog, like a spaniel or a beagle. Mm -hmm. I like the long ears, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fun dog. <laughs> like I would like any dog, even like a like even like a, a mix. It doesn't matter. It would just not a huge dog because I don't have a big space. And I'm not mm -hmm. a big fan of tiny little yappy dogs. So I'd like a yeah. medium sized dog who like like that had some substance to them. Jump up on the couch and stuff. Hang Aren't out. Those with little them. dogs like the craziest. They're they're like they have no concept of how small they are relative to the rest of the world. And uh I don't know if they're fearless or stupid or some combination. They've got big egos. My, my, we used to have two tiny dogs. They were, um, one was a Yorkie poo and one was a peek poo when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, the little Yorkie poo snored louder than my father. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's an interesting factoid that we'll leave the audience with. You so, beautiful. Little buddy. Thank you. Thank you again for coming on the, the podcast. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And, uh, you know, at one time we had talked about doing some writing together. So maybe we should uh, revisit that. That sounds good, because I'm really like got this thing in progress that's just been stuck on my computer for a little while now. So I would be mm -hmm. very grateful for a little bit of uh, moral support or something. <laughs> sure. Be happy to. I mean, awesome. so many people have helped me along with, you know, getting my book to the finish line. So uh, it's only fair that I help others uh, with their dreams as well. Well, I, I'm going to be wait. I'm going to be looking for a signed copy of my book when I, when your book comes out. Okay. You want it signed by me or somebody else? <laughs> okay, I'm going to sign off. Thank hugs, you, everybody. Fred. Hugs, Fred. Hugs, hugs, hugs. 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 <laughs> Thank you for everybody for tuning in to the Dead Man Walking podcast. And um, I hope to see you around next episode. Please like, share, promote Deb's work, help her find new clients and attend her trunk show and uh, just help her help make the world a better place. Thanks. See you next episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.